Hey, this is Faye, and today, today I am returning, or well, sort of returning at the very least. I have finally gotten out of the work pressure, where I was constantly running one extra day worth of work every week. And that's fantastic, and I cannot even begin to describe how lovely it is to just be out of that. So. Thank you, thank you all for your loving and caring and encouraging and supportive messages that you left on the previous video, that, that really meant the world to me. I truly appreciated it and well, some of them did make me tear up quite a bit with gratitude and empathy, so thank you. Right, so back to where we were and it was actually quite frustrating to, you know, get so majorly hit by work right about then because for once, for once, I was ahead of schedule. I had all of the drawings done the day after the deadline for submitting the questions and this is in large part because I made a time limit where I can use more than 15 minutes per sketch in total. So that was fairly fast and well, then life happened. I also did have a little bit of an issue with not being able to see your comments. I could see some under the notifications and this happens every now and then actually and it bugs the heck out of me but I can't seem to figure out how to fix it because it's not listed under restricted or potentially inappropriate comments or anything. This is just YouTube removing stuff and I will say this here, if I can I will respond to your comment. If you don't get a response from me on your comment, this is because I cannot somehow, for some reason, actually click it and see it or it's disappeared under the video. But I think, I think I managed to get all of the questions gathered here. I really hope I have. And if I haven't gotten yours, I'm sorry. Please leave a comment and if YouTube will not allow you to leave a comment or I, I can't see it at the very least, then I don't know, find me on Twitter and hit me up and I will respond to you there. Alright, so no more meandering around, I promise, but I will try to make some timestamps so that you don't have to sit through all of this. But you guys had a lot of questions and I really look forward to answering them, so I will do my best to come up with some answers and I do also have a little bit of an update on some project stuff. So, here we go. Okay. First question is from some Galician guy and it is about any wild theories for Endwalker and I am putting this right at the beginning because we might as well get the spoiler warning up here because there is no way in hell I'm gonna get through a video like this without messing up somewhere so there will be spoilers. I'm very sorry about that but well I'll try to keep them mild. I'll try to keep the big turns and twists and reveals and names out of here but yeah, might as well just put up the warning sign straight away. This whole video is in danger of spoilers. Now, as for actually answering the question, well, I feel like we're gonna see a little bit more of the Gnostic or Jungian or Tarot-like themes that Final Fantasy has always loved and always incorporated and I feel Final Fantasy XIV especially has incorporated a lot. And with the tarot, it is actually interesting because what I mean with that is not so much the divining meaning of, of the cards, but the story that you're told. Where, you know, you start as an adventurer, as a fool who is in fact the most divine creature and, or, well, one of the most divine creatures and it's called down to earth or it's taken shape upon earth because it wants to explore. But at the point where it arrives on Earth, it can't remember how divine it is, it can't remember who or what it was, and so it has to learn and it goes through this trip where it sees the world being split into the upper part and the lower part, the light and the darkness, the male and the female, the mother and the father, and through the trip of this duality and all of the consequences of splitting up the world in light and darkness, eventually the fool remembers what he is and he reclaims this divinity and unites these two things and it's, it's a little complicated I can hear it. it it works better in my mind but I, I guess I should really make a video on this at some point huh anyway my bet is that they are gonna run with this theme a lot further in the last chapter than they already have and I also have this super out there theory on the anima up on my channel because while it is unlikely that this is gonna happen, I'm 
still helpful. Like that would still in a way make sense to me, maybe a little bit. I, I don't know. I, I, I think it would be cool if they do that. Other than that, it seems like the things that I had on my wish list on my last Q&A video actually might come to happen. It seems at the very least way more likely now than it did back then. Yeah. I also recently played through Shadowbringers again. We are on the sixth time through that at the very least. And I was reminded how closely not only our storyline as a Warrior of Light follows Joseph Campbell's narrative models for the story, but also how Alice and Alvina respectively follow the same structure of the hero with the thousand faces. How the hero is called to adventure and then he refuses the call, but then shit happens where you can just not not go and then, well, I'll, I'll stop here, otherwise we will never get past the first question, I'm sorry. Alright. Second question is from Lens Hunter, who is asking about art and creativity and how to regain the spark. And that feeling that I think we can all relate to, where you feel like everything has passed you by. And, I mean, I get that, I've had that feeling, it is terrible. I hate it whenever it happens and I feel like it happens to me many times. It is a recurring theme, it'll, it'll sneak back in every now and then. And sometimes it's something that somebody says or me looking at old stuff that I have done back when I was in, you know, I felt like I had more sense of what I was doing or had more time to practice so I was objectively speaking a better artist back then. Or it will be whenever I look at friends' works, because I actually have friends who went into animator jobs or, or artist jobs, and I feel like I fall behind because they are absolutely better than I am. But I tried many times to get back into drawing, and I get these ideas, I see characters, I invent worlds or places or stories, and then I get really disappointed that they can't just turn into this big comic book project that I always wanted to make. But this is actually where stuff like Final Fantasy XIV is such a boon for me. Because I love drawing characters that are settled and centered in a universe, but if I don't have to invent neither the universe nor the character, then that actually makes it easier for me to make a project that is whole and that I can finish, which is great. So yeah, especially stuff where I draw, like Drawn to Lore has really helped me. I have regained so much of my artist uh, mojo throughout my, my doing that. And uh, I mean, obviously, if you can doodle a little bit every day, then that certainly can help you. Because I think one of the things that really bugs me is that I can see whenever my skills deteriorate over time, I feel like it feels like a defeat to even try to get back into it. But here I just, I make this agreement with myself that the first hour of me doing stuff will just be me trying to regain my bearing. And I know that whatever I draw will likely not be a keeper and that's fine. The first hour of whatever I do will suck. This is, this is the thing that I tell myself. The first hour of what I do will suck and that's okay. And then I try to fail faster. So instead of starting with the eye and then the nose and then the face, I make a lot of stick figures. I make quick sketches to make something that works as a cohesive picture before I start finishing anything. And then I may have a hundred or a thousand unfinished pieces per finished one, but well, that works for me. Obviously, you will have to find ways that works for you. But finding something to do this for, other than just wanting to reclaim your skills, that, that certainly helped me at the very least. All right, Terra Doe? Am, am I saying that wrong? I'm probably saying that wrong, I'm sorry. Terra Doe asked, what are your favorite music tracks of Final Fantasy XIV? top five or top three or something like that and I'll just say that Shadowbringers for me had a lot of fantastic numbers especially the boss fights or the raids like holy hell but uh, I don't think any of us managed to get into the Great Wood without getting gripped by that theme and I don't think any of us got out of there without at the very least at some point having been singing la uh, <laughs> I also really love the Turn the Light On from the Eden fights because it had such a beautiful tone 
but then it's also have this really progressive rhythm that is almost riding through all of it and it's it's a tempo that I've only learned to know as a turbo samba, which I guess is not the formal term, but that is what I what I know it as. But it uses these syncopations throughout this this part here, or I think it uses syncopations. I, I'm actually not sure. It's been a long while since I had music, so I don't really know. The other great one for the Eden fights for me is Twice Stricken. It's just fabulous. It starts out with a very known theme and this haunting singing, right? But you can sort of feel the tension underlying that. So even walking into this one without knowing what is going to happen, you just know that you're in for right. Like you know something more is lurking. And then I guess for me personally also, because I used to do show dancing when I was younger, way younger, right? An opening like this will just magically make my brain search for somebody who's yelling five, six, seven, eight, right? Because it, it builds so very clearly to that change in the music. Two of the last boss fights in Shadowbringers story, and you, you, you know which one these are if you played the, the full story. They also have some of the best music and it just never fails to send shivers down my spine. And some of it is, you know, deceptively calm even though you're running around trying to dodge mechanics. And then of course we can't go through this without mentioning the Big Fat Kato song. And I am sorry, I am so so sorry, I know, I know, I know that they're singing Beat the Heart of the Beak, the Heart of the Beak, the Heart of the Beak. But all I'm hearing is just... Big fat kato, the big fat kato, the big fat kato, the big. And well, now that is the theme I use whenever I'm on my fat cat mount and farming something like Borsha. <laughs> it's just running in the background. Also, Answers. Answers is so beautiful. Like, I know it has a lot of power that it borrows because of cinematic that follows it, but just that feeling of despair and the hope and the pain and the inevitable resolve and uh, it never fails to get me to tear up or get those awe shivers. So this is a plug for hashtag please go do the coils. Please watch that one. It's worth it, I swear. And Heavensward also have so many good songs and Dragon Song will always make me misty eyed and I just love that one. I hope that covered that somewhat. I could really talk about the music for hours because I love video game music and I always have ever since I found out that you can put the game CD into the CD player and then I just skip the first number which was where the game was and then listen to the tracks of the game while I played. Right, fourth question is from Nika-chan who has three questions. And one of them is what aspect of the Final Fantasy XIV lore we don't know much about intrigues you the most. One that goes about my favorite beast tribe. And what do I find most difficult to draw? <laughs> and I'll answer all three of these. So for the first one, which part of the lore intrigues me that we don't know that much about? Gilmora, give me the lore that you have fought through for this area. Please, Square Enix, please. Uh, I know it was set up to be important in 1.0 and it's alright that we get Alec instead because as a lost world it is further in the past and it is it is interesting but you had made an underworld home and people were living there and they lived there for 337 years between 740 and 1077 of the 6th astral era and then two-thirds of the population decides that now that the elementals will allow people to live in, in the shroud, they will just up and leave and they go and found Gridania. And the last third really tries to make this underground city work. And over these 500 years where those remaining really try to make this huge metropolis run, they turn blue or ashen. Like those elephants that stayed on after 1077 and until the exodus was complete, they turned blue and ashen and, and, and what the heck happened? I want to know. Like, did they poke something they shouldn't have? Did they get cursed? 
Did they try to fix the lack of population by calling upon help from somewhere else, like the Void, and then get tainted by it? I, I don't know, but they do have a higher base stat in mind and intelligence than their Wildwood counterparts from back when that was still relevant at the very least. So I don't know, maybe that indicates that there could be something about that. But either way, they left the place and they're now roaming and then a portal came, the palace of the dead, long story long, but I really wish that they would revisit Gilmora as a city, as a lost civilization. I really want to know. Favorite beast tribe? <laughs> that would have to be the Namazu. I am sorry, it is not classy or anything, but the yes yes are just winners. Let me just read aloud some few gems of conversation that you get through this and we'll see if that won't sell you on it. And I know that it's a hard sell because the Namazu that you meet in the main story quest really does the clan a disservice. It's terrible. I want to I want to really punt that Namasu and at least gets to do it right but the thing is that he does not sell the Namasu well but these sentences might get you on it. Kyotaku who says we might have become ever so slightly carried away with our plans for Mikoshi mass production. On a completely unrelated note, we have decided to reward our invaluable festival assistants with their very own Mikoshi. You need only give a shout and our bearers will come forth waddling. Go forth and share the wondrous spectacle of our Mikoshi with people near and far. And then Gyobi. Poor Gyobi. <sighs> I still cannot get the hang of it. Who knew that archery would be so difficult with fins? Wait, you knew? You knew and you did not tell me? And then Gyoro, who says... Quite a few of our many, many attendees have come bearing gifts. Sorting through them all is hard on the fins, but fascinating. I can even taste the ones that I think are food. I am sometimes wrong. I don't know, I, I feel like they just have fantastic lines. They have this really sideways logic and it's beautiful. And the most hard to draw for me is, well, I guess very classically hands and structures. I am fairly all right with hands in sketches, but it's still a, a work in progress, right? Because I often sketch stuff rather loosely at first and then it'll look okay in the sketch. But then when I start hammering out what actually works, there is always stuff that needs to be changed. And with hands, it's so little that defines how much it's turned or how the fingers are and joints and blah, blah, blah. So yeah, there are plenty of options for that to go sideways where it looked right in the sketch, but then it looks like shit in the actual drawing. I guess that is a classical problem. Question number five is from Melody Jimmy and he asks, are you into role-playing or do you just really, really like lore? And the answer to this is yes, I am a role-player. And I actually have been for most of my life. And back when I was a teenager, I even played Dungeons & Dragons 1st Edition, which was my first encounter with that system. And we got the 1st Edition because a friend of mine's older cousin had passed down a copy to him. We were all very excited. Over here you can go to a boarding school and you generally do that when you're 15 or 16 years old and I went to one that was for drama and theater and music and dancing. And so we all thought that, you know, what would fit better than role-playing? I mean, this is basically improv just with a system behind it. But we had a very, 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 very Christian headmistress who was just not having any of it. Like this was devil worship and we would all kill each other and it was terrible. So we just did it on the weekends. <clears throat> And you know what? It actually isn't terrible. And you actually don't summon any devils. And you actually don't go kill people unless you wanted to kill people in the first place. So, you know, I'm, I'm still here. I'm still fine. So sorry to disappoint Koa, but no. So I started with stuff like D&D and then I played in different groups throughout my teenage years and my early 20s. And then eventually it moved to forums and then to games and... I just think it's a really cool hobby and you get to write stories with other people and it's really, it's fun. It's a collaborative way of writing. You should give it a go. But that said, 
I also really, really love lore in and of itself. However, when you are a role player, it is also a matter of needing to know. Well, at the very least, this is how it feels to me. I want my character to have a background story that fits with the world. I want him or her to be knowledgeable about the things that a person with that background should know. And well, thankfully, in most games, you can always make a character to test the waters that is a little uneducated somehow or other new to the region, new to the kind of job, maybe just have lived very sheltered in one way or another. And this will actually allow for your fellow role players to educate you. But it does really feel very rewarding going into a role play just knowing the background of the lore. So yeah, this is also why I made this channel. Like this is some of the stuff I really could have done with knowing myself before I got into Final Fantasy. Sixth question, Regal Teraton asks about my in-game character and the backstory for her or the lore, a main job and where she's from and what she does. And again, as a role player or as an immersive player, I think about this a lot. So Faye was actually originally created so that she could be wandering from town to town and participating in things here and there, taking odd jobs here and there and allowing for me to help out at events or to create storylines as an NPC kind of quest giver or a helper for whatever was needed. Because I had so many friends in the game that were doing events and the like. And, you know, it's just nice to help out. And as such, she was created to become a flighty kind of person who would be here one week and then she would wander somewhere else and go wherever the wind takes her. And she's always been a little bit airy and cheery with a silly sense of humor and a strange way of viewing the world, being often a little bit of a headache to those that are around her for how her brain seems to, you know, view the world in a slightly odd way. She is from Gridania and she is the daughter of an odd couple who are very well versed in magics and she is the youngest of three siblings. Uh, she can cast basic formaturgy spells and has likely also picked up some hard hitting ones but mostly she is seen with bow and arrow because I started her out as a bard and I don't know she's retained that kind of bard e quality about her. Sadly, I haven't had much time to roleplay as of late, and since I picked her as a, my mouthpiece for this channel, I've actually taken her out of my roleplaying roster. I do, however, ro miss roleplaying with my little airy airhead, but, uh, well, that's, that's how it is, and I've created other characters that sort of takes her place instead. But I do still love that she does have a background story, and I do still think about it when I <laughs> when I draw her and when I emote her around. Like, that is, that is who she is, and that is also what she represents over in me. Alright, question 7 is from Voids and Potato Queen, and she also asks about my character, the main inspiration behind her, and whether she is the same as when she was made, or if she is kept on expanded on. And, well, like I mentioned, I made Faye in large part because I needed her for events and because I needed a character that could travel around and visit different places. But she is not quite the same as when I created her. For one thing, she's gotten more airy and weird as I've gone along. And her hairstyle has also been swapped from these neat braids to, to this because I love the unruly nature of the Rainmaker ponytail and I just happened to get it way back when it was in the Make It Rain campaign. And then she got her Spriggan hoodie and she just never moved out of it, I guess. I do feel that characters are built up over time, but I like to very quickly find some quirks and flaws that I send in my characters around to give me a feel of where they will shine and where they will struggle. And I generally try to define what they want, what are their goals and desires and what do they think will bring them fulfillment and what they strive for, and then also what they need, what would truly bring them that sense of accomplishment or fulfillment and well, while those two can be related, they're very rarely one and the same. But yeah, it gives me a good idea of what I'm working with character-wise. And I do this for every character I make, mind you, not just the ones I take into roleplay. Also, just if I'm playing a game and I get to be in the character creator, it will take me forever to get out of it. Because I will think up what kind of person would this be? I'm a terrible actor? 
but I actually feel like I do care to work in writing relatively well if I am to pat my own back here. So yeah, it's, it's a huge interest of mine and something I get a lot of joy out of. Question number eight is from Santa Prime. And what made you invest in the lore of Final Fantasy XIV? Was it something from real life? or just how good the story of the world of 14 is. And well, I've always loved lore and world building way more than the actual stories. I love character work and clever writing most of all, but knowing how a world works and seeing the ideas behind that, that is really magical to me. And as an old role player, I, I guess I have a natural drive to uh, you could say, orient myself into the lore of the game. Even if I weren't to roleplay in it, I just seek out, okay, so what would a, what would a miller know? What would a bartender know? What would a person that was renting out horses know about the world? Right? It's, it's an interesting extra pair of goggles to see the world through. And, and I feel it's very rewarding to do so at the very least. And I do this in all games that I play. I dive in deep into the story, the continuity and the mechanics of the world. And this is regardless of whether it's Mass Effect or the near games. I've done this all the way back to when I was playing Guardian Heroes <laughs> and Knights into Dreams on my old Sega Saturn. Because I just, I was curious about, okay, so she's the knight captain of the squad. Huh. So she would be oblivious to this part of the lore, but then, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right, it, it's just a fun way to, to view the world, I guess. Yeah. So now that I think about it, actually, um, I'm wondering, maybe it's actually my attraction to lore and world building that has spurred up my hobby of role playing rather than the other way around. I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure on that one, actually. Uh. Question number nine is asked by Lilith, who asks, when will we finally replace all world leaders with Namasu, as is the natural order of things? And then also asks if there are any characters in 14 that I have dramatically changed my opinion on, and if so, why? And if there are also some of the slightly less known or less spoken of people that I like. And well, let's start out with the important one here, because I mean, if you strap on a tie on a Namasu, does this not work for you? Yes, yes. Like, would this not be a fine world leader? The blank expression? No? <laughs> anyway, as for characters in 14 that dramatically changed my opinion on them by ways of of improving, I guess. I will have to go with this self-important, snarky and belittling little snot dwell brunt because, oh my lord, um, who now happens to be one of my absolute favorite characters, but Alfino absolutely started as that rich kid that you just wanted to trip up. And while I did enjoy him actually talking back to Minifilia because she was being unreasonable about not wanting to leave the science old hideout, I generally didn't start liking him before he started growing up at the end of Heavensward and then throughout Shadowbringers. And then in Shadowbringers, he's phenomenal and people are free to disagree on this, but I feel like at the very least that his interactions and his his lines and his his personality and especially his interactions with his much more pragmatic red only sister are just <laughs> they're just comedy gold and their their dynamic never ceases to amaze me and I really enjoy that. And then of course there is an Asian who we are all introduced to being all quirky and dramatic and weird and the reigning bad guy really wants to kill him so badly. But then you actually get to see him in the expansion and he is a pretty fantastic villain and character. And yeah, I have hope for that lightning to strike twice. So here's crossing my fingers for Endwalker. As for characters that we don't get to see super much, but I, that I really appreciate or am interested in, uh, Maxima, the Galleon, I actually really like. Ichika would be another. Rowena and Geralt. Oh my god, if you've not read the story on these, 
Oh, it's heartbreaking. There is there is actual reason why they have this dynamic that they do, and it is actually a really heartbreaking story. So yeah, many characters. Final Fantasy XIV has so many characters. Also, Arnwald and Fordola, but we are we're gonna see more of them, I'm sure. Question number 10 is posed by Bakuta Florist and they ask what do you think about the Hildebrand questline and I can only say that I think this is something everyone should try at least for the first full one like it's it's fine to opt out of it and I know that you guys hate whenever things are pushed to you because we all do this we all get so so pushily enthusiastic and it's actually a little bit of a problem for us but just just try the first the first full section and here's why and it mostly comes down to this is the most self-aware fourth wall breaking content I've ever played in normal video game where this was not the general tone and the way it's incorporated is just bloody brilliant. The way that they string these together is that they very often offer some important comment on how the world works and important oftentimes smaller areas of ongoing conflict or social problems or themes that are in this expansion that are important to this expansion but they're laying it on so thick and there are always some normal people involved that just become that one sane man that just have to watch this whole ridiculous thing play out. And it's it's fantastic. Like you are in awe of how weird shit gets. And you're really feeling how that, <laughs> that one sane person must feel with this. And yeah, the way the mandevils in general work and interact, like they're just different rules for them than the rest of it. It's just mwah, chef kiss. It's just brilliant. I am so sorely tempted to put in some key scenes here, but I really don't want to spoil the experience for anyone. So, but I mean, okay. So if, if that doesn't appeal to you, because I totally get this will not appeal to anybody, but just look at these dances. Okay. If nothing else, do it for these extra and super stylish emotes. Okay. Yeah? All right. Question number 11 is asked by Pia, who asks, where do chocobos come from? And are they native to all lands or are they from specific parts and imported? And what have I named my chocobo? And let's start with the first one, because my chocobo is called Kwe. Because I imagine here is Faye and she's getting her chocobo. And the first thing that it's gonna tell her when she asks, who are you or what is your name is Kwe. And so she's gonna name it like that because that is how her logic works. As for the actual question, we should have a video on this at some point because I love Chocobo so much and there is quite a bit to be said here, but I will try to give an answer without diving in way, way too deep. And I'm gonna fail, I know this already, but I try, okay, give me points for effort. So what we do know is that Chocobo are at the very least native to Eorzea in this era, but up until recently, they were only ever bred and raised in the Chocobo forest in Dravania. And then they are taken to Ishgard, where they are taught to be steeds. Back in 1565, so that's about 12 years before the beginning of A Realm Reborn, Ishgard actually puts a ban on selling to the rest of the Alliance. And they cite the reason that the Gallian Fred is over because the Imperial forces have withdrawn and they seem to stay in Girabania after they got shit scared <laughs> because the Midgard's armor came out of the Silvertier Lake and numbed the Agrius in 1562. So that is about 15 years before everyone was born. And so because there hasn't been any invading activity in about three years time or so, the Ishgardian says, well, we need all birds and forces on hand because, well, Nidhogg's alarm clock rang and now he's flying around toasting hamlets and cities in our area. So you will have to do without our birds. A personal guess of mine is that there is also a lingering disappointment that they themselves did not actually get help from the Alliance. 
and now they simply can't keep on giving out help without the Alliance coming to help them too. Because when you look at it, it kind of makes sense, even though it seems a little bit petty. I mean, the city has been at constant war with a much larger and deadlier enemy. And even though it has been this, it has found the resources and men to come to the aid of Eorzea in fighting off the Alamegan army, for instance, that invaded parts of Eorzea under King Manfred, which was back in 1468. So that's, what, 109 years before Rome was born? And they did this, the Alamegans did this because of political unrest that was created in large part by Limsa and Ulda because trade had gone missing from Girabania because the Uldans were too cheap to pay what it cost to have things moved over land. And the Limsans were just seeing a chance to offer a sea alternative to yank that trade deal off of them. And also actually Gridania because they refused to give them any parts of their territories to feed the Megan population now that there was less trade going through Alamigo. So they couldn't buy crops from anywhere else. And well, when you look at this, it, it, it just, it is just really shitty farmland, isn't it? It, it? At the very least, it's not the lush farmland that you can find in the more Aetherfic parts of Eorzea. So yeah. Iskard ended up trying to help the rest of Eorzea clean up their mess. They were part of that war with Alamigo too, and was part of why it was actually won those 109 years before Everly Born. And actually, because we're talking about Chocobos, it's important to mention that a Chocobo played a very vital part about winning that war. <laughs> if you want to hear about him, just jump to the second half of me trying to read my little Chocobo stories that were published back in 1.0, because it tells the tale of this very valiant Chocobo that won this war for the Alliance. Anyways, now Jogobos are back to being sold to the grand companies and we even have an ex Ishgardian who've set up a new racing grounds in Gridania, so they are getting more and more spread out. However, they are also native to many other parts of the world, where the standard Chocobo may look different and have another color than the ordinary yellow that we're used to. And I guess part of that might be because of some selective breeding to get certain traits in your Chocobo, and some of it might also just be because the local diet is different. The Gallians must also have known about Chocobo, because when you look at this Magitek Walker, look at how it's constructed, okay? This is a steel chocobo, just like a car is a steel horse or a horse plus a carriage. I mean, the implied logic is that it is biped and raptor-like in design because, well, when you are used to seeing a bird that is carrying things or carrying people move like that, that will become your basic schemata, your basic logic for how does stuff move? How do you move a person about? So the implied logic is that it is just closer to their imagination and their basic assumptions on how things are propelled even though, mechanically speaking, it would be much harder to nail a balance than a four-legged creature. So, yeah, I love that that is in there and it's just such a small thing that it's not really even mentioned, but I love this game's lore, I just, I just do. Alright, question number 12 is by Fernando Ferry, who asks, where are you from? And what do you think Final Fantasy is missing to become an even greater game? And if we're talking about geography, my accent may very well have given this away, but I'm Scandinavian. More specifically, I am Danish. There are a lot of words that I have a hard time pronouncing, but you all seem to be understanding me just fine, so that is good. What does Final Fantasy, in my opinion, lack to become perfect? I can think of a few things like fixing the code so that we can make the housing system work and such, but well, I guess there's also the issue that perfect is such a hard word to define. But a thing that I really missed when I came over to Final Fantasy and which it actually used to have, as far as I've been able to tell, is the expression or mood system. So. Back in Star Wars The Old Republic and in EverQuest Next Landmark, you could set a mood or an expression and it would change how your character's face look. In EverQuest Next Landmark, it changed how you emoted even. A clap while you were in an angry mood would be this sarcastic slow clap, while a happy one would be just a more giddy and bouncy clap. 
and in Star Wars The Old Republic, your expression just changed how your character's face looked and it would just stick like that. So if you had a character that was constantly scowling, you could set the mood to slash annoyed. Or if you have a character that was being a little bit full of himself, you could set it to slash smug. And I don't know, it was just a really brilliant way to make your character feel unique, even with fewer customization options, because you could define how they looked, right? Here we have changed how you stand, which is phenomenal. Like that is just so good. But I really wish that they had kept that emote system. And you can still set moods, but they go away really fast. It's, it's clear it's made more for G poses than anything else. And I think that it got removed because people were dissatisfied that it stuck and they forgot to do a straight face and get back to no, I don't, I don't know, but I wish they had this because it feels like an opportunity missed. Question 13 is by Sunny Bloop and they have two questions. If you could erase your memory of a single Final Fantasy XIV campaign to re-experience it fresh, what would you do? And if you could do the same for a single game of your choice, what would that be? And if I could do that with a single campaign, I would like to say all of Shadowbringers. <laughs> Even though, and this is actually funny, even though I really enjoy just following along and see how many clues that have been actually planted and hinted at along the way. So I love watching Let's Plays of it. But that whole expansion, at least up until the Warrior of Light part, like, whew, pure mind blow and pure heartstring plucky stuff. Like, it is it's so good. I wish I could do that again. Or the road trip with Istinian and Iseli, that was also like, I really wish I could experience that for the first time again, because that was also just so good to see how that folded out. And for a game that I would love to re-experience without knowing it, well, Nier would be a good one, but actually probably go with Mass Effect 2, because to me at least, it had a damn good sequence at the last part where you had to pick your team for the last mission based on the people's merits and skills and how strong the mutual trust was. And this would affect how that scene played out. And it was made in such an elegant way that if you just paid attention while you were playing the story and you just knew these characters, like you had taken an interest in them, you didn't need the meta to pick the right ones because you'd know, okay, this person is an engineer. Or okay, this person would probably be good at infiltrating. So you would have that feel for them. And if you just trust them with the mission and have done their trust missions too, uh, you would get the best possible outcome. But it was just... I, I bloody loved how different it felt with different characters on different roles and how the story shifted. But there will always be the first time that you play through that scene and it will always stick with you. So that would be nice to re-experience entirely. Same for Mass Effect 3 with Morden. If you played it, you know what I'm talking about. Always love that scene. Question 14 is asked by Nox, who asks, who is your Final Fantasy XIV crush? And I actually sat down and tried to rank them because I was stretching my brain so hard trying to answer this. And there are people I crush on for the character and people that I crush on for their looks, but mostly I think I'm drawn to the characters that makes for interesting foils for other characters or that drives the plot forward. And... Because of this, I guess a shit stirrer like Nero really has to take first place for me. And this is in large part because of his interactions with Sid during the Omega raids, where they're just this old married couple. But I mean, pretty much any raid where this petty betty is part of is just great. And yeah, I guess maybe I should figure out a way to make a ranking video where I actually try to explain and justify and excuse my, my thought sequence here. But seeing how that would clash with the more detail-oriented stuff that I generally do on this channel, I don't know. We'll see. Maybe, maybe I can put it elsewhere. I don't know. But that kind of leads up to the next one, I guess. Question 15 is asked by ASMR Gourmet who asks, why have you not monetized your channel? 
And first of all, love the name. <laughs> Second of all, I have monetized it and I am earning about $10 per month. So Google can't really seem to find my address at the very least not on AdSense, which is kind of funny because I'm pretty sure that Google knows everything else that I'm doing. It just pretends that it doesn't know where I live. So I've actually not gotten my account verified for a payout, but I, I do have ads on my videos. I had to. Somebody alerted me to the fact that YouTube actually had put video ads on my content, even though I'd done my best to keep them ad free. Because honestly, I will never become a professional YouTuber anyways. And this is just going to be a hobby project. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with profiting on your hobby. I just, <laughs> I prefer to think that people can listen to my videos without being interrupted by ads. I grew up far out in the country and we only had a couple of channels and none of them had ads. So I always found it annoying and unnatural to be interrupted myself whenever I watch stuff. So I don't want to push that on other people. But YouTube put ads on videos even though you, even if you're not eligible for a partnership to actually do so yourself and even though you don't profit from it. But thankfully, another awesome YouTuber called Lucron told me that I could weasel my way out of this by putting on these banner ads. Because then I had put ads on the videos and thus it weren't listed as undecided YouTube just decides in YouTube system. Mind you, they may very well change this later on, but for now this seems to work, which I'm very happy about. And yeah, you also asked about that I should make some of my more soft-spoken content and some of this content that I started with. And well, back in the day, an incredibly wise friend of mine said that I should either do soft-spoken content or I should do content where I actually wanted people to pay attention. <laughs> because if I spoke about things in my soft tones, then people would zone out or they would fall asleep. So I opted for the second route more. But I think I will actually follow her advice completely now and make a second channel for more softer spoken content where there is less of the graphic side, but something that could be easier to update in periods of time where work is cray cray, because it'll probably become crazy again. And yeah, so consider this the first teasing of a channel. And if I actually manage to make it before I release this video, then you can find that channel in the description below. And it will only have soft spoken or relaxing content. Question 16 is asked by Carlos. Do you know the lyrics to Rent and can you sing them? And do you have any favorite books or authors? And... Well, you are so close to typecasting me just right, but actually Rent is sadly not in my wheelhouse. I am, however, a little musical kid and I do sing. And while I don't sing very well, I used to be fairly good at it and I love doing it. Outside of Final Fantasy XIV's fantastic writing, I enjoy a lot of great authors and I will have to sing the praise of Sir Terry Pratchett, whose wit and wisdom really shaped me into the person that I am today. I absolutely adore his character writing and he really is a master of satire in many ways. And some of my favorite books are actually some of his. I love the ones that he does with both the witches and the wizards, but I think the City Watches ones, like Night Watch is fantastic, are just some of my favorite. Monstrous Regiment, I think if I had to pick one book of his that you had to try, even though it is a little bit late in the series and even though it, it only hardly stands alone, it's, it's actually pretty good. Yeah, otherwise, his collaborative work on Good Omens made me get to Neil Gaiman, who is also fantastic, but he makes a much more coherent world and have a flair for the fantastic and, you know, the fey logic and amazing sideway logic kind of ways of, of building worlds. And it, it just works somehow. And also Don Rosa, who's a Donald Duck artist, is also a great author. He sat down and he tried to make sense of all of the little hints and stories that Carl Barks had made in his Donald Duck comics about Scrooge McDuck. And he actually managed to string together a coherent story, like a background story that just works. It's a little bit dark, but it's also 
it is so amusing and it's so detail oriented and it's just really a good read. Question number 17, Minoru. I am probably butchering that name, I am sorry. I uh, would like to ask what I do to relax or what things I do to stay healthy in mind, body and soul. And well, as you can tell by this video being so delayed, one of my strategies for keeping healthy is to know my visiting hours. I am getting increasingly good at a strategic retreat. Uh, I can't fix everything and I work in a field where there will always be more problems that need to be solved and it always is urgent, but I can't fix all of it. And there is really something freeing in realizing that the world is not on you, even if it does feel like that at times. And so I actually prioritize my time really well and I make time for stuff that is fun for me because I need to recharge myself. I need to be something for myself before I can save anybody else, right? That is the same thing that you get taught whenever you get up on a flight, right? Put the mask over your mouth and nose before you put it on the child. You need to stand in order to help people up. And so in order to still keep standing, I need to know when I will have to tell people, all right, now I need to retreat for a little bit and gather my energies or when to reach out for help, which I am really good at. And something that is a skill that we need to practice more in society, I feel, both of those. Like not just a now I'm running away from it all retreat, because most people can figure out how to do that if things are sufficiently bad, but the asking for a break when you need one, not when it is overdue, but when you need one. That I think we need to practice. Aside of that, I do stuff for me, which sounds terribly egotistical, but like we just discussed, I can't help people if I am not standing myself. And well, Video games work wonders to alleviate that feeling of frustration and especially frustrations that are born out of situations where we feel helpless or where we feel powerless because video games give you the content that you can throw yourself at and then get the feeling of empowerment when you can actually master and finish that content. And like I also said in the video before, I lost a lot of coworkers during Corona. Not, they did not die, they just, they. I, they were just gone from me. Some of them were sent home and some of them quit due to the pressure. And the few of us who were still left there were just scattered to cover as much as possible. And I mean, we did what we could with staying in touch and that was good, but we lacked a group or well, I lacked a group that was sort of my squad, you know? I, I lacked tackling challenges of the everyday work life and sharing that and just feeling like I was part of a team. Online, I got that. I had a team. And we had dumb jokes and we had silly war cries and we just did whatever was fun or challenging. And sometimes that fucked up spectacularly, like hard content can, but it was hilarious because there was nothing important at stake and it was really fulfilling to do stuff that was hard but something that you could get over you know and also very importantly i had you guys the final fantasy community in general is great and supportive but much more than that i had you lovely people that are here on the channel and this is gonna sound pathetic, I suppose, but you have no clue how happy I was for every comment that I got or every person who decided to join this merry band because it meant that it really meant something to know that something you do is not just ephemeral. It's not just putting out fires. It is not just fixing something that will be burning tomorrow anyways. It is actually seen and it, it made somebody's life a little bit richer or calmer or funner or better and it's still standing. And video making is just such a great hobby. I really encourage you to give it a go. I don't know. I like to think that I keep myself and people around me very positive. We can complain about the world and things that bugs us and things suck sometimes for sure. Life can be shit, but that's part of the package. And even when it is tough at times, you know what, this'll pass. This, you just have to tough it out and not forget to live while you do so. Just find a way where you can get as much happiness as the situation affords you, even if you are waiting for better and brighter skies, because you deserve happiness and you're worthy of it. 
and you don't have to wait for something specific to happen in your life to allow yourself the small moments of happiness. And that also starts with figuring out what actually makes you happy. And I guess that togetherness and feeling of <laughs> achieving something stupid or fun or challenging, even though it is digital, together with people, that is that for me. Question 18 is asked by Kyle and they ask What sort of games did you play before 14 and are interesting in anything coming out of in the future slash are going back to any classics you may have missed in the past? And well, that is a hard one. Well, the first one isn't, but it's gonna be very broad. <laughs> I've played very, very different games, from platformers to puzzle games to MMOs to, uh, I guess, shooters and strategy games and all sorts of things. There are so many games that I've played and loved through the years. And, well, I can say that I was extremely excited for Wildstar and I was part of the beta there and for EverQuest Next Landmark where I got into the second alpha or whatever they called it. But neither of those games made it through time so I'm starting to think that I am sort of a, an ill omen. <laughs> the moment I get on the hype train is the moment it's bound to derail before it's reached the station so I generally don't get hyped about stuff but I generally play a lot of games and then I have one MMO that is my recurring point. And that has been both Aeon, it has been World of Warcraft before then, it was a Rift for a while and Star Wars and it has been many things, but I have really found a home in Final Fantasy now. And I think this is the longest I've stayed in any MMO ever. And I'm far from done with it. Like there's still so much content I haven't done. And then aside of an MMO home, I have little games that I like to play outside of that. And that can be stupid puzzle games or co-op games where you lay down tracks or cook stuff together or gotcha games. Or Recently I replayed Final Fantasy XII and it is so much better and far less punishing. So thank you Square Enix for fixing that. I will also eventually have to finish up the Dragon Age stuff. I played 1 and 2 back when they came out. <laughs> I never really got into 3, life kinda happened. but I likely will at some point, but for now I just have so much fun in 14 and I would really rather spend whatever free time I have outside of work and real life to make content, because that is way more fun. <laughs> Question 19, M. Reed asks what is your proudest accomplishment in Final 14? Or at, alternatively, do you have a treasured Final Fantasy 14 memory that you can share with us? And I have so many, so many. I can't even. I think one of my proudest moments was when we got to the end of Palace of the Dead twice because we got the wrong one. I wanted the, the glass pumpkin and of course we got the fire crest, but then thankfully if you get two fire crests, you can turn it in for a glass pumpkin. So I was just like, ah, okay, <clears throat> we made it to the bottom. Anyone else want to come along? So we did this twice with two different teams. It was awesome and it was so tense, but it was also the most hard fun because it's, it's random. So it can be so unpredictable and it could be so cruel, like so cruel. And there are so many split second decisions that you have to make that just makes a world of difference. And I think that is probably content wise what I'm proudest of, even though it's, it's fairly common to be able to do it, but it was so tense. I think another one that stands in my mind was, and that's not so much a proud moment, but it is probably my favorite moment or one of the most touching ones that I'll share is that my FC mates had planned a surprise party for my birthday. And this will require a little bit of explaining or background setting. So first of all, I'm not a very big fan of minifilia and I'm sorry, but minifilet is just not anything for me. And my friends know that this is just a button that they can press and then I'll be off ranting for a good 20 minutes or something like that. But, but this has led to a really stupid trend that people would hang or hide a minifilia portrait in my house. Sometimes they'll just hover it straight in front of the door. 
so it's the first thing that you see when you open it. And then you might say that I shouldn't be sharing my house with people like that, but well, collaborative efforts. And I mean, let's be real. It takes a special kind of love and devotion to just decorate your friend's house with minifilia portraits. And it's, it's also really hilarious because you can see in the FC chat if somebody buys a new portrait for FC points. And sometimes we'd be on a call doing some other stuff and then you can see the, the FC chat saying Fran just spent X amount of points on a picture of the antecedent. <laughs> and I'd be just start shouting, oh no you don't. But any road. I generally don't celebrate my birthday much. I never have. I always, like, I, first of all, my birthday is during the summer holiday. So I've never been very lucky with actually making parties outside of the family coming over because all of my friends would be out of the country for my birthday. So I never really celebrated it that much. I didn't think much of it. But this year, there were some awesome people that were hiding at my house. And I was led there because I got alerted to the fact that it might have become minifilia bombed. And then they were all there with confetti and Realm Reborn Red and oh my god. Yeah, I'm not gonna start crying, but I, yeah. <sighs> that didn't even answer the question, did it? But that is not a proud moment, that is just a treasured memory. And one of many, many ones that I have from this game. Anyways, I think that is all there is for now. Also, also, I wanted to show off some of the awesome fan art that I got. Because like Emrit said in the comments, uh, they draw Faye. And look at this! Like, oh my god, how cute is this? It's got the spiky hair and it really nailed that expression of just jubilant enjoyment on an unrelated note slightly for Doris. Like... Uh, yeah, but I am actually reminded of myself when I was a child and some of the many, many animals on the farm that had to endure my love for animals. I had a pet chicken that I may have held exactly like that. So yeah, this piece is adorable and I really love the energy that it gives. And then Voice and Potato made this one and oh my god, oh my god, I don't think Faye has ever looked prettier. Look how pretty this is, look how soft the colors are and how confident the lines are and how it just works well with the toned down colors and oh, I am floored. I want to be able to draw like this. This is amazing. Thank you both of you so much. And thank you all who actually asked the question and sorry to those who didn't actually get to see it because YouTube didn't tell you but wanted to. If you have a question, you can ask it in the comment and I will probably answer it in a comment. But yeah, I, I am not sure that stuff like this really belongs on this channel. So if I actually do make another channel, then maybe I will do more questions and answers over there. But I really enjoyed doing these and I really enjoyed also doing the sketches of your characters and of your requests. That was super fun. They are just sketches, I will hasten to add that they are 15 minutes of work, so yeah. Some of them don't look very good and that's fine. Some of them turned out all right. But anyways, I think that is all I have for now. And looking at it right now, I think this is the longest thing that I ever made. So I will see if I can shave a little bit of the babbling off. But otherwise, thank you so much for watching and have a really lovely day. Bye.